Okay, this is where we, this where we stopped last time. We were on uh, talking about the scientific method and the way the scientific method works. These, there are one, two, three, four, five steps to the scientific method. Some people give it another step, but um, it's just a roundabout going back and forth. Who just job dropped in here? Jamari, I have you, you are present. Okay. So this is the way that almost all scientists work. They develop a hypothesis, they perform the controlled tests on their hypothesis, um, developing uh, variables, two variables. One variable is the independent variable that they will manipulate. The other one is the dependent variable that may or might not change. And if it does change, then we know that there's some sort of a correlation between the two variables. And what we're going to try to prove is that there's a cause, causation, that one causes the other. Uh, and hopefully we haven't got any confounding variables out there that will have caused us to get a result that we didn't expect uh, and think that it's, or think that the two variables are correlated when the confounding variable is actually the one that makes the connection between them. So we gather the objective data. The objective data is the dependent variable. And then we analyze the results, all that data, uh, using statistics. And remember, statistics can be used very poorly. So make sure that you understand the statistics when somebody gives you a statistic. And where did that come from? How did they use the statistic? Uh, there's all kinds of ways to uh, make people believe things that they shouldn't believe based on statistics being improperly um, evaluated. Remember, uh, everything I tell you can be truthful, but not the whole truth. So uh, we reject sometimes our hypothesis is wrong, the statistics show that it's wrong, and we have to reject our hypothesis, but it still means we learn something. We learn that these two things do not have a connection in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's no correlation or causation between two variables. And people need to know that too, because there's another person out there somewhere thinking of the same thing that you're thinking if you're a scientist and thinking they want to do this whole testing and make sure that their hypothesis is correct and they go out and research it and find out, oh, you already did the research, you already did the experiment, and it turned out to be negative, so they don't have to repeat it if they don't want to. Or they can replicate it thinking that maybe you did something wrong and there was a confounding variable out there that you didn't uh, test for. So remember I said people will criticize you uh, and criticism is not a very nice thing. And if it doesn't, if it's not really a critique of your experiment, if it's not a critique of your behavior, then it's not worth listening to. If somebody's just criticizing you for the um, thrill of criticizing you, then just turn your back and walk away. A critique is something that tells you what you did wrong and why you did it wrong and how you can do it better. And there are lots of people that just want to make you feel bad. They're not worth listening to. So that's the difference between criticism and critique. Uh, so we reject it, we publish it, people tell us what they think of it, they read the information, and it's, uh, it's a process. Many times you'll have to do more and more research because just one experiment showing that there's a causation between two variables does not prove the, that one is causing the other. You need multiple attempts at different experiments before you can say, yes, this variable causes a change in the other variable. There are other types of research that don't do the variable manipulations. So they're called just straight empirical research. And one of them is the naturalistic observation, another one is case study, and another one is survey. And in naturalistic observation, you are watching animals or human beings to see how they work in their natural environment without manipulating any of the environmental variables. You're just watching. 
And it's important that you're not seen because if you're seen, then you become part of the environment that was never there before. And all of a sudden, uh, the people or the animals will act differently because of your presence. I had to do a naturalistic observation when I was in college, and I chose watching people eat at McDonald's because <laughs> I could then eat at McDonald's too. So I was sitting there from about 11 to 1 o'clock. I sat and took notes on what people were eating and how they ate. And my hypothesis was that they will drink more often if they have eaten a lot of French fries uh, because of the salt on the French fries. But I'm not looking for a variable and I'm not looking for causation. I'm just looking for correlations at this point. I'm looking to see if my hypothesis is correct. And what I would have to do later is actually manipulate those variables, but at this point I'm not. I'm just watching people eat. And in one case, just about noontime, I was watching one person and I was writing down what they were doing and I looked up and that person is looking directly at me. <laughs> and I go, uh, he picks up a, a, a french fry and he goes to eat it and I go to write it down and he puts his french fry down. And he picks up his hamburger and goes to eat it. And I go to write it down and he puts his hamburger down. Right? Now he's being controlled by me. And I can't use his data because I'm interfering with his natural processes. And he came over to ask me what I was doing. And I said, I'm doing a research project on what people eat and how they eat at McDonald's. And so then he pulled his tray over. He sat down next to me. And then he was watching the people and telling me what to write down. So I didn't miss something as I was looking up and then looking down to write it, they might be doing something while I was looking down. So I was just writing then at that point. Um, but that's naturalistic observation. And of course, you don't want a lion to know that you're there when you're observing them because they'll eat you. <laughs> so uh, you've got to be aware of the creatures in your, in, that you're looking at, but they can't be aware of you. And of course, uh, people that studied the uh, great apes and chimpanzees, they were, they had to be very careful because uh, now gorillas and chimpanzees are not very deadly animals. They won't attack you, but they, you're there in their environment and they don't know who you are. And so they act very differently because you're there. And so Jane Goodall is one of them. Jane Goodall had to um, be very careful about what she attributed their behavior to. It may just be because she was there, but eventually she, she spent enough time with them that they decided she was just a really ugly ape and <laughs> they acted just like normal and they, they took her into her tribe basically and became one of the tribe members and then they didn't act very differently around them. Now she could really write down what it was that they did and how they acted. So that's naturalistic observations. Case studies are where you study one particular person in depth. So the experimenter uses interviews with that person, interviews with people that, that know them or, or knew them, and um, historical records, letters that they wrote, letters that other people wrote about them or to them, and you gather all this information together. Now, why would we want just one person to know just one person very well? And that would be people like Jeffrey Dahmer to find out what makes a murderer, a mass murderer. And this is a really important issue. What causes a person to become a mass murderer? Is it just something that they're born with? Or was there a nurturing of some kind that made this person into who they are? And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that particular type of problem in the pathology section. And then surveys. Uh, they, you probably have surveys that have come in the mail to ask you questions about what it is you use to brush your teeth and um, who you're going to vote for. And these are interesting pieces of paper to me. I throw them out. I never answer them. Even when they include a dollar to entice you to finish it, I just throw them out because most of the time I find the questions in them to be very broad and easily misinterpreted with um, answers that are impossible 
I don't want to answer any of the ways that they answered, and I have a different answer altogether, so I can't write it in. They're forcing me to take one of their answers, and so I don't use I don't do surveys. When people call me up on the phone um, for asking for money, I tell them I don't give money to anybody that's a, that calls me up on the phone, and it turns out I don't give money to anybody that sends me any brochure either, because anything can be faked, and so if you get a piece of paper for the Democratic committee or the Republican committee, how do you know that that's the right address that you're supposed to be sending the money back to or the check to? And they can just use you that way, abuse you that way. So I find out where the actual department is and call them up and make sure that I've got the right place and then I send my money to them without them having to send me anything in, in advance. So uh, many experiments like these natural observation, case studies, and surveys, they're looking not for causation, they're looking for correlations. They're looking for things that, that seem to connect together. For instance, drinking and french fries, you know, eating. So correlations when one variable moves with respect to another variable. Now we have a coordinate plane and you've been taught all your life that the coordinate plane is zero. Everything above zero is the positive side, everything below zero is the negative side. That's what we've been taught all our lives. And this confuses students because if two variables are moving down together, it is a positive correlation because they're moving together. And that's what, it, that's what causes us to say it is positive. If one goes up a little bit and the other one then goes up a little bit, that's a positive correlation. If one goes up a little bit and the other one goes down, that's a negative correlation. So if we see the, the variables going in opposite directions, that's a negative correlation. If they're going in the same direction, either up or down, it is called a positive correlation. So hopefully that clicks in you because a lot of students, when they see data and it's the data, it, or they just see the data in, below the coordinate plane, they think it's negative correlation just because it's below the coordinate plane. That's not the case. Even if they start below zero in the negative zone, but they continue to move in the same direction below or up, they are going to be a positive correlation. And if they're in the positive area and they start moving in opposite directions, that's a negative correlation. So it's, it has nothing to do with really the coordinate plane. It has to do with the way that the variables move with respect to each other. Now because of the mathematics involved, you cannot have anything higher than a plus one correlation, which means they're moving at exactly the same amount up and down, or a negative one, which means they move at exactly the opposite of each other. As one moves up one, the other one moves down one. So that is the correlational coefficient. Only plus one to all the way through zero to negative one. That's the, the only, it can't go 1.1. You can't do that. It has to be plus 1.0 or negative 1.0 or somewhere in between them. So positive correlation means the variables move in the same direction. Negative correlation means that the variables move in opposite directions. I hope you get that because that's on the tests and quizzes. Uh, zero correlation means that movement of one variable has no relationship whatsoever with the movement of the other variable. You can have a variable going up and the other one goes down sometimes, up sometimes. So there's, there's no real connection between the two. Now we never say that correlation is a cause of something. If you see correlation, we don't say one of the variables causes the other variable. And here's the reason why. When it snows in Australia, is there a correlation to buying ice cream in the United States, in New York? And the answer is yes, and it's a very strong positive correlation. The more ice cream is eaten in New York, the more snow falls in Australia. It's insane. What causes that? We certainly can't say that we caused it to snow in Australia simply because we ate ice cream in New York. But it turns out that Australia is in the southern hemisphere and New York is in the northern hemisphere and when it's summer in the north it's winter in the south and so there's a there's a absolute reason for it to be snowing 
in Australia. It's winter time, and there's an absolute reason why we're eating ice cream in New York, because it's summertime. And it turns out the hotter the northern hemisphere is, the colder the southern hemisphere is. So the more, the hotter it is, the more ice cream we eat, and the colder it is, the more snow falls. So we can't say it causes one or the other, but it's really interesting when we find correlations, and then when we find the correlation, we look for the cause, because we know what the correlation is at that point. Uh, correlation never means causation, therefore, more study must be done to determine if one variable controls the other or if there is something else controlling both of them. Now, there's errors that occur all the time, and we need to be very cognizant of the possibility of an error in what we're doing. So scientists must always be aware, cognizant, aware of the possibility of a bias in their experiments. And bias is any deviation of results or inferences from the truth. Bias could affect the way an experimenter designs their study. It could affect the way they collect the data, and it could affect the way they interpret the results. Um, bias can result from several different sources, one-sided or systematic variations in measurement from the true value is called systematic error. Everybody knows there are 52 cards in a, in a deck, a card deck, right? But do you ever count them before you actually play cards to make sure that all 52 are there? So you count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 52, 53. 53? They're not supposed to be 53 cards. So you turn them over and you look through to see if there's a joker somewhere in there. No, no. There's no extra card in there. So then you count them again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 52. Ah, good, 52. So I must have just counted wrong the first time. No. <laughs> We, sent, we assume 52 is correct because we know 52 is supposed to be correct. But that second time might have been the wrong count rather than the 53 could have been the right count. There could be two, three of hearts or, you know, who knows. But we assume that the second one is correct because we know that's what it's supposed to be. So we have by flaws in study design, or deviations of inferences, interpretations, analysis based on flawed data or data collection or our own belief system, our own um, expectations, right? There is no sense of prejudice in these particular types of errors. They just happen. There's, it, it's something that just happens and you can't, um, you can't get rid of them. So that's why you have lots and lots of different data that you collect before and hopefully the small little instances that are wrong will eventually just be gone because they're, they're such a small portion of the whole total of the data that you collect. So it's no sense of prejudice or subjectivity implied in the assessment of bias in these, in these conditions. Uh, but bias can be found on both sides of the experiment. Uh, the, the experimenter can do something wrong, but so can the participant um, through their own biases do something wrong. So one big one is called confirmation bias. It refers to a type of selective thinking where one tends to notice and look for what confirms one's beliefs and to ignore, not look for, or even undervalue the relevance of what contradicts one's beliefs. And there are two types of these. There's the personal bias and expectancy bias. We've already talked a little bit about the expectancy bias because I told you that there was a a school that they took the IQ and then of all the students and then they, um, the experimenters found all the students that had the same IQ, split them in two groups and said this group has a low IQ and this group has a high IQ and told the teachers that. And then because of the expectation of the teachers, it turned out the students with the low IQ, supposed low IQ, actually lowered their IQ during school that at the that end of that year and the students who had a supposedly higher IQ actually did have a higher IQ by the end of the year. And it was all because of the expectations of the teachers and how they worked with those students. So expectancy bias is a very strong way of changing the world around us. By personal bias, if you believe that a thing is true, you make assumptions that may not be true. You assume since this is true, then when something comes up that may contradict you, 
you just throw that out. Now that's not worth um, even considering because it's obvious that this is true and there's just something wrong with the way you're thinking. No, no. Um, you have to consider other people's thought processes and other instances that happen to deviate from your own personal bias. So personal bias can be caused by prejudicial feelings, certainly. The expectancy bias can also be called a self-fulfilling prophecy, which means that you have a belief that you're not going to do something well, and therefore you don't try to do it, and you end up not doing it well. In other words, um, you don't believe you're going to pass a course, so you stop studying because you don't believe you're going to pass the course. And you won't pass the course because you stopped studying. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You did the things necessary to actually end up at the place where you said you would end up. Uh, there's a lot of um, economics in this as well, where in, in economics we say, oh, there's a recession coming. Oh, there's a recession coming. Everybody thinks there's a recession coming. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, well, um, I'm going to save my money and because the last time I went through a recession, I was out of money and I need money to pay the bills and uh, to pay the you know rent and, and to eat. And so I start saving my money. I don't go out to eat as much. I don't buy extra clothes that I could have. I don't buy extra games. I don't do, I don't, I, I am very picky about where I spend my money because there's a recession coming. Well, the fact that all these people then stop, stop going out and stop spending their money. Uh, the products that are already on the shelf aren't being sold, so the manufacturing companies, they shut down. They basically furlough all of their people, and then uh, eventually it ends up at the, at the consumer's area where there's not enough people buying, so you don't need as many salespeople. The salespeople are laid off. And so we, by not spending money, cause the recession. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, if a person believes that something is going to happen, then they will ignore data that does not conform to expectations or may ignore data that confirms or denies the expected results. Uh, also, treatment of the subjects will be different if the experimenter has an expectation of performance differentiation, and we talked about that in the children's uh, elementary school situation. If I know a student is better than another, then I treat the better student differently, and this treatment alone can cause one student to perform better than another one. Observer bias is an interesting one because everybody uh, sees the world differently than another person, so we have lots of different ways of looking at observer bias. If the observer sees things through rose-colored glasses, then they miss all the carnations in the world. And we know that mistakes happen. Um, for instance, I might whisper something in somebody's ear, and then they're supposed to whisper in another person's ear, and then another person's ear, and it goes all the way around till it comes back to me, and it has nothing to do with what I said, because the observer, the person that heard the first whisper, actually heard something based on what they know in their brains, and then they passed it on to the next person who had the same issue. They hear it differently until it gets back around to me, and it's like, I, that's not what I said. <laughs> so pass around a story, and the story grows. Uh, this is a distortion of evidence due to personal motives and or prior experiences, and it may be due to faulty technique. Uh, missing an abnormality of some kind, incorrect measurements, or misinterpreting the data. And there are two different varieties. There is the inter-observer and the intra-observer. Inter meaning two different people or more, and intra being me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I, right? There's three of us here, and we all have their different ideas, right? So inter-observer variation is the amount which observers vary from one another when reporting on the same material. Uh, five people reporting on an accident can report five different views. And one of the reasons for that is that we're, we tend to uh, see what is important to us. So if you're Catholic and there's a whole group of people standing around and something happens, but there happens to be a priest in that group of people, you're going to pay more attention to the priest because you're Catholic. 
If you're Jewish, there's a rabbi. You're going to pay attention to the rabbi. If you are white and there's one white person and a whole bunch of African-American people, you're going to pay attention to the white person. If there's one black person and a whole bunch of Caucasians, you're going to pay attention to the black person. And children love to pay attention to other children. So we see and experience a particular event differently than another person might. Uh, men pay attention to men, women pay attention to women, uh, short people to short people, large people to larger people. So uh, it, it changes the way you view the event because you see it from a different perspective. Uh, that's, we'll talk about this in memory because memory just is a horrible. Our memories are not very good. And um, when you have an observer of a particular event and the police want your statement, they want it right now. They want your statement immediately so that nothing else can interfere with what you think you saw. And when you're called to court, if it's a big enough problem and something goes wrong and they have to take it to court, a court case may be a year off. And in that year, you have heard people talking about the thing that you saw, that you witnessed, and there are lots of different ways that people talk about it. You hear it on the radio, newspaper, you read it, you see it on television, your friends and your relatives are all talking about it. When you get to court, all of that stuff is in your memory. All the other things that have, that have been said about it are in your memory. And when you pull up that information into, to, to pay attention to it in your head, all those memories come along with it, even though they have nothing to do with the original memory event. And so you're, you, they never ask you in court, what did you see? They give you your statement and say, is this your signature? It is. This is the statement you said to the police? It is. Good. Read your statement to the court. Because that's the most pure part of your experience of that particular event. So uh, intra-observer intra is seeing things differently based on the, the fact that we've seen something and then we've heard something else about it and it all comes up into our brain at the same time. The inter-observation is that each person sees it at a different view. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of yeses. So, um, confounding variables we've already talked about. When I talked about my experiment with the hot room and the cold room and whether people would do better on tests in hot rooms or cold rooms, and I didn't think about the fact that the outside temperature may have something to do with that, and that's a confounding variable, a variable that could change the results that I did not have in my data. So, I don't know if it affected the data or not, if it affected the results or not. So that's a confounding variable. We do tend to try to control for biases, and we can control for some biases, but there'll be mistakes that are made um, in all research. But when we, when we do uh, look at our experiment, we want to find the best way to do it with the least amount of bias. So control groups are used to separate normal population from the experimental group. We've already talked about the control groups. A uh, person wants to test a drug, so they have a group of people that have a specific type of cancer, and they're going to give that drug to these people to see if it affects the cancer, and then they have a whole other group that also has the same cancer, but they're not going to give anything to those people. They're going to watch and see if there's a difference in them caused, hopefully, caused by the drug that you're giving them. And that's a very, uh, it's a hard thing to do ethically uh, because we know that it is, that doing absolutely nothing for your cancer is going to allow the cancer to grow, and we're hoping that there's going to be a difference between the two groups. Uh, but we also have to consider the fact that just giving a pill to somebody can make them feel better. It, doesn't, it can be inert substances that have quinine added to it, taste bad, so it seems like it's an actual medical pill of medicine, and yet 
there's nothing in it. It's, we call it a sugar pill, but it's not really a sugar. You'd know it was sugar if, if you took it, you would taste the sweetness. Right? But we call it a sugar pill because sugar pills should not do anything for you. Um, unless, of course, you take enough of them, you'd get fat from taking too much sugar or you have hypertension or diabetes from it. Right? But this is just a single pill a day um, that they're taking. So uh, we call it a sugar pill and we call it a placebo because we find that if you take a placebo, a sugar pill, and think that it's going to do something for you, that a certain percentage of people actually get better taking the placebo pill. So just because we gave people a medical pill, a pill with medicine in it, doesn't mean it's the medicine that got them better. It could be that they just had felt better because of the placebo effect of, oh, I'm taking this medication that's supposed to make me feel better. And how does that work? Well, if you are stressed, if you're stressed out, then your immune system does not work as well. The more stressed you are, the less your immune system works. So if you're given a pill, a sugar pill, and you think that it's going to do good for you, your stress level goes down. You're not as stressed. Oh, good, I have a medicine that's going to help me. So I'm not as stressed. And because I'm not as stressed, my immune system comes back up online and starts to work again and, and cures whatever it is ill that I have. And that's called the placebo effect. And it can be as much as 33% of the people who actually take a placebo pill that get better or have a reaction because of that taking that pill that should do absolutely nothing to them because it's an inert substance. So that's called the experimental group is the one that gets the actual experiment done to them. The control group is the group of people who are having nothing done to them. And the placebo control group is the group that has something done to them that should have absolutely nothing, no reaction whatsoever to, like a sugar pill. So the placebo control groups are used to counter what we call the placebo effect when a dependent variable changes in the absence of a controlled variable. In other words, people got better even though they weren't given the medication. There's also a way to, uh, we don't want pay people to know what we're doing for them sometimes. So for instance, uh, in this particular case with uh, cancer and the uh, placebo pill or the medication pill, we certainly don't want people to know that they're getting a placebo because their stress level won't go down knowing that they're getting a placebo. So we have to tell the, the, the subjects in the experiment, maybe 100 people, all of them have the same kind of cancer. We have to tell them we have this, you are on this experiment, 50 of the people in this room are going to get medication. 50 of the people in this room are going to get an inert substance that they think is medication. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Everyone thinks they're the one that's going to get the medication. And so they feel better when they get it. But, that, but we've told them, you might get it or you might not. We don't tell the people you're, you're going to get you are going to get the medicine and you are going to get the placebo. So that's called a blind control. The subjects do not know what's going on in the experiment. They don't have a, a concept of what's going to happen to them in the experiment. They have some sort of idea what the experiment is. And so the better, even better way to do this is called a double blind because I as the experimenter know what the sugar pill is and what the regular pill is. And so as I'm giving them out to people, I will treat them differently. The expectancy effect. I'm really, I feel bad for the people who are getting the sugar pill and I feel pretty good about the people that are getting the actual medication. So if I treat them differently, that could affect the results. So instead I hire somebody to actually give out pill A and pill B and they have no idea which one is which and 
when they then collect the data, the data is sent back to me. That's called a double blind. The, the subjects of the experiment do not know what's going on, and the person performing the experiment also does not know what's going on, so that there's no expectancy bias that can occur in the, uh, in the experiment. Does that make sense? Do I need to explain it another way, maybe? I'm getting yeses. So, okay. All right, so the um, double-blind experiment is actually not a psychological thing. Double-blind experiments occur in all scientific inquiry. It is the gold standard, the good double-blind. If you see something that says it's a double-blind, placebo-controlled experiment, that is the gold standard of science today. So yes, there are ethical issues, of course. We, uh, we have to lie to the subjects. Uh, we can't tell them the whole truth. As I said, I can tell you everything I tell you can be truthful, but not the whole truth. And that's the case. We're deceiving our subjects. We have to. We can't tell them everything about the experiment or it would change the results of the experiment. But then we, we debrief them. We tell them the truth when it's over. We tell the subjects what was happening afterwards, and that's called debriefing, talking to the subjects when the experiment's finished. And informed consent is telling them what will happen as much as we can without telling them the whole truth. We're telling them as much as we can in the beginning to make sure that it's okay with them that they're going to be in this experiment, that they will accept or consent to be in this experiment, and that's called informed consent. When subjects are given enough information about what they're going to do, that they can then consent to the experiment or not. It's up to them to decide whether they want to be in the experiment or not. And of course, animal research is a big deal. Uh, using animals in scientific experimentation, it's, it is highly controlled today by ethics committees. We will see some of the experiments in some of these in motivation, especially where um, animals were just horrifically um, damaged by and even killed um, by the scientists until the ethics committees came along and we have independent review boards now that decide whether you could treat the animal better and do the experiment differently rather than hurt the, uh, the poor little animals. Now I had, most animals are under these, these ethic committees responsibilities. But there are rats and pigeons are not. Rats and pigeons are not part of, uh, are not protected. And uh, I guess that's because people don't see rats and pigeons as um, lovey-dovey animals. But I had 150 rats in my master's, the for my master's thesis. 150 rats I had to take care of. And lots of students say that we, we starve the animals. And that is not the case. We gave the rat as much as it wanted to eat for a whole week. So every day we gave it a lot of food. At the end of the day, we took back the food and measured it. We knew exactly how much we had given it at the beginning of the day. We knew exactly how much was left over, so we knew how much the animal ate every single day. We took the average of that in a week, and then we gave them 80% of what they wanted to eat. We're not starving them. We're just making sure that they're hungry because they will look for food. And to get the other 20%, they had to do tasks. And they will do tasks to get food. But if they're as, as filled as they want to be, they just lay on their backs and scratch their tummies. They don't do anything. And so we can't get them to act. Well, if we keep 20% of the food away and they have to do something for that food, then they'll do it for that food. And I had one, I had these rats were just wonderful little animals. And two of them I kept after the experiment was over as pets. Um, and one of them would sit in my pocket as I wandered around the University of Georgia. And, they, and it had some food in the pocket too. It, it would eat every once in a while. But they're just incredible little animals. Um, you uh, have a, one problem with rats is, uh, and, and pigeons. They don't care where and when they poop. They just poop. <laughs> You, you can train a cat to go in a litter box. I've trained a raccoon to go in a litter box and a rabbit to go in a litter box because I've had all kinds of animals as pets. But you can't train a rat. It just poops when it wants to poop. So um, all of my shirts 
they had to be cleaned really well after he was sitting in my pocket. So that's animal research. And uh, animals are treated as well as we can as we can treat them. And even the material that the information we get from experimenting with animals, the information is useful for psychologists and veterinarians who work with animals. So just because we're studying the animal for human to find out what how humans act, we also know how animals act as well, and then we can work with animals that have issues because we've learned how to through these experiments. Um, I never went for my PhD, and one of the main reasons I didn't go for my PhD was because at the end of my experiment, I had to put all 150 of those rats to sleep, kill them. Um, and I, it, was, it was a horrific experience for me, and I decided I wasn't going to do that again, and so I didn't go for my PhD. Plus, I had discovered what computers were like, and I really fell in love with computers, and so I went back to school for computers instead. I got three more degrees in computer science, but, um, and I kept the two rats that I liked. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't kill those. But you can't have a rat that's been through one experiment go into another experiment because it's already learned something. And in most cases, we want a clean, fresh slate to study. We don't want a rat that already knows something about what we're studying. Um, that would be like uh, telling a subject everything about the experiment, and then you your results aren't going to be good because they already know everything about the experiment. And so you need a fresh batch of rats every single time. And I decided that wasn't something I wanted to ever do again. So that's uh, the ethical issues in psychology. And uh, that's the end of this particular section, history and science. And now we'll go on to the biology section. But before I do, are there any questions about the history and science of psychology, that unit? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of no's. So you're all cool with it. Very good. All right, uh, I see that Quinn is here, so I'm marking Quinn as present. Who else was not here? Is Tiffany here? Tiffany, I see you, Tiffany. I got gotcha. you. You're here. All right, and Jacob, did Jacob come in? Yes, he did. I got you, Jacob. I see you. And Alexander, yes, I see you too, Alexander. You're here. And the last one is uh, Elijah. Is Elijah here? I do not see Elijah. Oh, and uh, Zaria. Zaria is here. I got you, Zaria. All right, so that's everybody except for Elijah. So let's go on then to the biological section and talk about biology and new share. And here we are. All right, this particular section is about the brain and the nervous system. <clears throat> and we will also talk about the endocrine system too. We'll talk a little bit about that too. But um, this is the study of, the, of us as human beings, our bodies. And our bodies are called nature not the environment. And a lot of students get this really confused. When we're talking about us, our bodies, we're talking about nature. And what causes our nature to change and behave in specific ways is the environment, unless it happens to do with genetics. If it's a genetic issue, then it is also nature because that, that genetics is part of us. So we can actually point to certain places where genetics is changed and the development is changed because of um, environmental factors. But let's talk about biopsychology. Now first, biopsychology can also be called psychobiology. In, in English, we use the adjective before the noun. Our noun is psychology because this is a psychology class. So it is biopsychology. But if you were in a biology class studying the mental portions of how biology affects you, then it would be psychobiology instead of biopsychology. It's the same thing, just from a different view. Right? 
So biopsychology is the specialty in psychology that studies the interaction of biology, behavior, and the environment. Neuroscience is a field of study that is an interdisciplinary field that focuses on the brain and its role in psychological processes. Interdisciplinary, what does it mean when I say discipline? I'm not talking about spanking your child. That's not, that's not the discipline that we're talking about. In here, the discipline means the type of field of research that you're in, chemistry, biology, physics, okay? all of those are involved in the brain. The brain is a chemical creature. The brain is biological, right? Biology, chemistry. It is an electrical field, and physics takes in the electrical and magnetic fields, and magnetic fields change our, our brain, change the way it works. So in neuroscience, you have a a place that's a neuroscience laboratory, and in the laboratory you're going to find biologists and chemists and physicists all working together to try to study the brain. That's what interdisciplinary means. And this unit, you'll see, is all about biology, but this is not a biology class, it's a psychology class. So a lot of students want to know, why the heck are we studying all this biology? And by the time we're finished with this unit, I hope you will have an answer to that. But if you're in the biology classes at the same time you're taking this class, we'll go, we, you'll see we're very close to the same things you're studying at this particular point in time in your class. So biopsychology is all about nature. Our nature refers to our biology, our organs, the brain, and the chemicals that control us, whereas nurture on the other hand, refers to the outside, our interaction with our environment. So our parents love our shelter, nutrition, and education. And uh, it's a big question in psychology, just like the structuralists and functionalists used to fight all the time, there are people who fight over which is important, the, nat the nature or the nurture. They're both important. The the question is, which is more important, the nature or the nurture? That could be, and that depends on the situation that you're talking about. So if I have a Down syndrome child, do any of you know a Down syndrome child? Yes or no? Does anyone know? A, some of you do know Down syndrome child, children, okay? So... The Down syndrome child is the most loving, wonderful, connected person. I mean, they just, they're so wonderful as children. Um, but they are also slightly mentally deficient compared to a normal person that doesn't have Down syndrome. And in the old days, very long ago, they would take a Down syndrome child. They knew that you can tell that a person's Down syndrome. They, in the old days, said, oh, they're useless. They'll never mount anything. And they put them in an asylum where they lived their life out being given the minimal amount of attention that they needed to develop. And so, yeah, a self-fulfilling prophecy, they put a Down syndrome child into a facility like that. It will not be useful member of society. But if you give, net, if you give that child the nurturing they need, the environment they need, their parents love, the shelter, the nutrition, the education, they become a tax-paying member of society. They can, they can do a lot of different things. There's now a, a Down syndrome adult now who is a, um, a runway model. They can do, and, and a model for pictures and posters and stuff. So they can do all kinds of stuff. Um, they won't be scientists, um, they won't be uh, mathematicians, but they're going to be able to learn a trade and they're going to be able to do that trade and pay taxes, get, pay, take care of themselves. Uh, they'll always have to have somebody that looks in on them every once in a while, but for the most part, they'll be okay. So which is more important, the fact that they had the Down syndrome or the nurturing that keeps them from having, that helps them to develop to their full potential. Certainly, potential of a Down child is a little bit lower than a normal child. But if that, if this is the potential that a, norm, that a Down child can get to, the Down child may get to their full potential. 
And this may be the potential of a regular person, but they didn't get all the loving they need, all the uh, everything that they need, the nutrition and education. They may end up down here. Just because you're normal as a child doesn't mean you're going to be as, as good as the Down syndrome child when you become an adult. It depends on what happens to you in your life. What happens to the nurturing in your life? So natural selection was proposed uh, by Charles Darwin in 1859 and is the driving force behind what we know as evolution. Uh, and what I mean by evolution is what people say is the environment selects the fittest organisms, but the environment does not select a thing. The environment is neutral. It's passive. It doesn't do, it isn't active. It's just there. So it is incorrect to say that the environment selects anything. Instead, we say that some animals and plants have a selective advantage in the environment they find themselves. They fit the environment better than other animals do. So they survive better, and they produce more offspring than the others. So organisms well adapted to their environment will propagate and outproduce the competition. And therefore, the course of evolution is known as the survival of the fittest. We have a lot of different trees in this area. And if we go into a drought season, there are some trees that need lots of water. They're not going to do well in a drought. And so the, the trees that don't need so much water, they will be fine in the drought. They'll produce their offspring just like they always do. And the trees that uh, having, having a trouble because of the lack of water won't produce as many seeds and flowers and whatever else, and so they'll be outperformed by the others. If the drought lasts long enough, they may even disappear, and the only ones that are left are the ones that fit the environment the best. That's natural selection. That's what it means by natural selection. This is not creationism. Uh, it is not uh, about how we got here on earth. We know that we have been here on earth in two weeks. Uh, it'll be, I think it's maybe three weeks, will be 5,780 years according to the Bible. The Bible is, you can, you can tell time frame from when Adam and Eve were placed on the earth. We've been here for 5,780 years, supposedly, according to the Bible in three weeks. Right now it's 5,779 years. Um, so I s say evolution is how we have changed over the 5,780 years. That's evolution. Uh, and a lot of people like to put evolution against creationism. That has nothing to do with how we got here on earth has nothing to do with our evolving of the human being as we've been a human being. Humans live longer today than they did 100 years ago. Crops actually give better yields today than they did 100 years ago. Dogs are bred into specific types for specific functions. Um, and there are species that have gone extinct, and there are others that have been found, new ones. How many of you have dogs? Does anybody have a dog? Say yes if you have a dog. Let's see, lots of you have dogs. Do any of you have a beagle? as a dog, a pet, a beagle as a pet. No, nobody has, nobody has a beagle. Beagles have been bred to go after foxes. And they were bred specifically so that they could dig. They could dig the den out. When the fox went down into its den, bigger dogs couldn't get to it, but a, a beagle could get into the den, at least to a certain point, and dig even better dig it out, dig the den out. If you have a beagle as a pet, your backyard that you put them in is going to be just full of potholes because that dog digs. That's what it does. It was bred to dig. And so it digs. It'll dig right under a fence. If you put up a fence in your backyard, it'll be in the neighbor's yard in no time at all because it'll dig right underneath the fence. We have specific animals that have been bred to be different than they were 100 years ago. And we'll talk about how the creatures presently on Earth changed over time. And I'll use the word evolved when I talk about how life changed while it was here on Earth. I won't talk about how we got here on Earth. That's uh, for a, a different type of philosophy class or uh, a theology class. Right? 
what does allow us to change? We uh, change because we have DNA. And the DNA exists in all organic life. Anything alive, organic life, has DNA in it. And it's a very long, complex molecule that encodes all of our genetic characteristics. Normal chromosomes contain two strands of DNA. A Down syndrome child is down because it doesn't have two strands of DNA on the 21st chromosome. It has three strands of DNA on the 21st chromosome. And that causes the issue of Down syndrome. So we know that on the chromosomes, in the strands of DNA, there are portions called genes. And these genes do things. So let me go to an annotation and uh, show you that, let's say this, this is a chromosome. And it has two strands of DNA. And on that strand of DNA, we have a gene here and another gene here. They are duplicates of each other, basically. On the autosomes, they should be duplicates of each other, but there can be errors or mutations that occur that are passed along throughout generations. So let's say this one right here, let's call this one S1. And this one here we'll also call S1. But this one is really large, and this one's very small. So this strand of DNA from the mother or father, wherever it came from, whichever one it came from, had a small S1 gene, and the other side had a large S1 gene. And most of us are a combination of uh, large and small. It turns out that if you have a large S1 gene and another large S1 gene on the other side, you are a person who almost never gets depressed. And when you get depressed, you come out of it much faster than somebody who has a large one and a small one and much faster than a person who has two small ones. They are very depressed individuals and when they get depressed, they stay depressed for a long time. It's hard to get them out of depression. This is a direct correlation of biology to a psychological phenomenon, depression. Kill my annotation here, clear it. And so genes, like S1, are the functional units of a chromosome. And there are thousands of genes in just one chromosome. And we have 23 pairs. So genes contain the instructions for creating proteins, basically, that's what they do. And, whoops, let me go back to my mouse. There we are. The unfertilized egg contains 23 chromosomes, while the sperm contains another 23 chromosomes. And when they come together, we get 23 pairs of chromosomes. The autosomes are almost identical to each other. Uh, there are 22 pairs of them. And then there's one more pair that's the sex chromosomes. And in a woman, they're almost identical. They're X and X. But in a man, they have one X and one Y. And that can cause major issues because the X chromosome is the one that starts up first. I'm sorry to tell you all you guys, we all start out as females. The X chromosome is working and the Y chromosome is asleep. Yeah, just like being in the kitchen and your husband's yeah, asleep on the couch, right? Yeah, the X chromosome starts off first and starts the whole process that creates us into human beings. Then the Y chromosome comes along, finally wakes up and does its job and turns us into a male if we have the Y chromosome. So the X chromosome, it can be very different from its pair, the Y. Almost every cell in your body contains these chromosomes and sometimes the chromosomes are damaged. They don't work like they're supposed to. The genotype is a word that means the picture of your chromosomes. And I actually have a picture of my chromosomes because I took genetics in school. Remember, I was a biology major. So I took genetics. And in that particular class, 
we took our blood, we separated it out, we, um, we did what we needed to do to open up the blood cells and to look at the chromosomes, and we took pictures of them. And every year, I used to, I was at the University of Georgia for eight years, and I, University of Georgia is 15 hours by dri driving to home, so I didn't go home very often. I stayed at the college. And uh, when I, every year I would take a picture and send it to mom and dad and say, here's, you know, here's a picture my, of me this year, mom and dad. Uh, that year I had a picture of my chromosomes, so I sent them a picture of my chromosomes. I said, here's a picture of my chromosomes, mom and dad. And guess what? It's also a picture of you and dad because, you know, mom and dad, because half of them is mom, from mom, half of them is from dad. So this is our yearly family picture of our chromosomes. The phenotype is what we usually take a picture of. The phenotype is how we look, uh, our skin color, hair color, eye color, weight, uh, height, all that is part of how we look, and that's called the phenotype. The genotype is your is your chromosomes, and they determine what your phenotype is going to be. And uh, there's a great variation in how much our genotype can change the phenotype. So we'll talk about some of that as well in this lectures. So uh, behavior that's consistently found in a species is likely to have a genetic basis. In human beings, when a child is born, 99% of children when, you, when they're born, you touch, this, touch the interior of their hand, and their hand will grasp and hold that particular object, whatever it is that just touched their hand. It's an innate, born reflex. It is genetic. It is part of the human characteristics. And we can say that the behavior, that behavior came about or evolved because it was somehow adaptive to living somehow it was useful for the child to be able to grab on and hold on um, and the ones who couldn't didn't survive and so those who held on and grabbed on they survived and their children then survived uh, because they had the same characteristics or it could have specifically been selected for by a breeder like the beagle right so adaptive adaptive means the presence or a of a condition which increases the likelihood of survival. It is an adaptive condition. And adaptation is as that particular adaptive condition functions, uh, the condition becomes more predominant in the population because it was adaptive. That's adaptation. Uh, innate means it was, it's born into us. It's a genetic code. It exists in every person. If you hear something really loud happen, you're going to go into the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. It is built into the human being. You're either going to run, freeze, or turn a fight when something goes off really loud nearby. That's an inborn reflex. So it's innate. Uh, evolution is the gradual process of biological change that occurs in a species as it adapts to its environment or as adaptation occurs. And mutations, and we'll talk some about mutations, are genetic variations which occur randomly, especially during the recombination of chromosomes and sexual reproduction. As the chromosomes separate their DNA strands, sometimes the pieces don't separate like they should, and you get a mutation that occurs. The way that natural selection works is that there's some sort of a change in the environment, like the, like I said, if we had a drought, for instance, it changes the environment, and everything that's out there then has to find water because it's hard to find, and those that can find enough water will survive, and there's a competition for those resources. So the selection of the fittest phenotype means that those who can deal with less water and those who can find the water better are the ones that will survive. The reproductive success then occurs because that particular phenotype also means there's a genotype and it turns into seeds or flowers or um, however that particular species propagates. The genotype corresponding to that becomes the fittest phenotype and it's passed to the next generation 
that also has the same phenotype that passes on its genes to the next generation. And therefore, the frequency of that particular genotype increases in the next generation and the next and the next until sometimes um, the other one goes extinct. And there's a problem right now with frogs because of the heat that we have in the world. It's not that the frogs can't stand the heat. They're fine um, in the water. They're, they're great. They don't, a little bit of hot water is fine for them. They don't care. But there is a fungus that grows in hot water that has not been growing very well for generations because uh, they ne it needs the heat. And so it's very minor amount of it in cold water. Uh, but as the water heats up, that particular fungus goes crazy and starts growing really fast, and it kills the frogs. And so we are losing frog species because of the amount of heat that we're putting into the environment. And even if we're not putting it into the environment, because there's a, there are people who say it's not human's fault, who cares what fault it is? We have to find a solution for it because we can't survive when it gets above a certain temperature and it's headed for that temperature. So we got to find a solution whether we're the ones that did it or not. So that's how natural selection works. Uh, behavioral genetics is a group that studies behavior and how it relates to genetics. So like depression and the S1 gene. Uh, in order to study the behavior, however, and relate it to genetics, we have to know what all of our genes are. And the Human Genome Project was the first ones to come up with a solution as to how many we have, and they won a very large prize for having done it. And it was only a couple of months before another came up with the exact same idea. We have 25,000 genes in, our, in the human genome, 25,000 genes in the human genome. And we have 25,000 other dead spaces in the chromosomes. And we still don't know how those particular areas, the dead spaces, are used, but we know that they start and stop the genes from producing their proteins. So it, what, we don't have 100,000 genes, which many people thought of in the past. They thought we had so many genes because we're so complicated, um, but we're not. Um, we have 25,000 genes, and it turns out chimpanzees are 98% their genetics, the same as our genetics. Chimpanzees are the closest relatives we have. So we know that there are 25,000 genes. We know what some of them do, like the S1 gene for serotonin. We know what that gene does. There's um, the AR gene uh, in, in the X chromosome that actually turns on the Y chromosome and um, helps the body to absorb testosterone. And if that particular gene doesn't work, we still get testosterone, but the body doesn't respond to it at all. So you have an XY person, that's a male, should be. But on the X gene, the AR gene isn't working. So they will develop into a fully, not functioning, but a full woman. They will develop as a girl, they will develop just like a woman. Their body looks like a woman. But they are usually sterile. They cannot produce offspring. Um, and they're the perfect murderer, assassin, because if they leave any genetic evidence, X, X, Y. So you're looking for a man. Nope, this is a woman not a man. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's an interesting aspect, genetics. A lot of people say people are um, homosexual or heterosexual or bisexual because of choice. Uh, sorry, <laughs> there is biological evidence to show why a person becomes one or the other. And um, they had no choice. That's just who they are. That is who they are. Uh, so that's the Human Genome Project. And a picture here I have of the uh, Down syndrome child um, is a genetic condition caused by specific chromosomal damage, actually excess, in the 21st chromosome. That's why it's also called trisomy 21, because there are actually three 
strands of DNA instead of the two that we're supposed to have that has three strands in the 21st chromosome, and th this causes Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21, and they have very heavy eyelids as well. Their, eyel their, their eyelids are um, heavier than most people, uh, except for one tribe in China, and the Mongolians, Mongols of China, have very thick eyelids as well, and so the uh, Down syndrome child is also called a mongoloid child because they look like the Mongols of China. So Down syndrome, trisomy 21, and mongoloidism is exactly the same thing, it's just three different names for the same thing. And I'm sorry, but that's how science is. We have lots of names for that. What is this? What, what am I holding up here? What is this? Somebody tell me. What am I holding up? A finger, yes. That's what we all call it, right? Guess what, it has a whole other name. The index finger. And phalange, it's also called a phalange. There's lots of names for the same things in, in science and that's unfortunate for you because you're now beginning to learn some science and you have to learn all the different names because it depends on who you're talking to, how they're going to refer to it. And so we have three names for a Down's child. Down syndrome, trisomy 21, and mongoloidism. Yes, if you go to a, a store and you want a double dip of ice cream and they end up giving you three dips, three scoops. Oh my gosh, I only paid for two and I got three scoops. Woohoo! So you might think that more chromosomes might be better. No, you need exactly how much you're supposed to have, no more and no less. So most people, you know the word most means not everyone, most people have two sex chromosomes, an X from their mother and an X from their father. That makes them a female in most cases. And an X from the mother and a Y from the father will make them a male in most cases. Some people have more than the X and the Y, and some people have less than the X and the Y. And I'm going to stop here and let you think about that and go on to uh, until we come back on Tuesday. So this is a good place to stop. I have uh, uh, like one person. Elijah, did you ever show up, Elijah? No. And that would be the only one then out of the two classes. I now have office hours. There's a Zoom. Uh, I've put it into, let me change this screen, new share, so you can see that. I have put it right here. This is the Zoom link now for your class, so you can actually click there to get to the class. I don't know where you've been clicking from before, maybe an email or the announcements, but now it's right here. And then there's office hours also I have on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 to 12. I will be on Zoom. I'll be waiting to see if anybody wants to talk about anything and get some confusion straightened out. And other than that, if you, unless you have something to talk about now, uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend and stay healthy. Hey, Kelly. The class is over.